Welcome. This is the Arizona's Living State Symbols Educator Webinar. With a little bit of an introduction for those of you that don't know me, I work for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. If you're not familiar with the Arizona Game and Fish Department, we are the state government agency that is responsible for managing all of Arizona's wildlife species, which totals more than 800 species of native wildlife that we are responsible for managing, managing the population so that we can ensure that that population, that species will exist today and for future generations to enjoy. Most people interact with us through like the sale of hunting and fishing licenses, and that's where they that's where they think of us. But we are more than just those hunted and angled species. We are all species, so including those that you can't legally hunt, those that are either endangered or that we might call our non-game species. My name is Eric Proctor, and I am the wildlife education coordinator for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. In that role, I work behind the scenes. So my job is to kind of provide you as educators support for what you do. We want to help you bring wildlife education, wildlife issues, wildlife concepts into the classroom. So I provide professional development and I also provide resources. I provide you with the resources to help you bring wildlife issues into the, into the classroom. So I oversee our program called Focus Wild Arizona, which is our wildlife education, sort of our K-12 program. And that's where you're gonna find lesson plans, teacher workshops, resources, all those different types of of things we i didn't mention this before but we are not even though we're a government agency we're not your typical government agency in that we are not taxpayer funded for, from any of your general taxes so there's nothing from your income tax that comes to us nothing from your sales tax that comes to us we operate much more on a business model or what we call a user pay model so it's the users of the resource that are the ones that are paying for it that's where your hunting and fishing licenses come in so when you buy a hunting license when you buy a fishing license that money is coming back to us for the direct management of those wildlife species. My salary and actually everything for this program, for the webinar and all of our Focus Wild Arizona program actually comes from the Heritage Fund, which comes from the Arizona State Lottery. So if you're not aware, when you purchase a lottery ticket, a portion of, the, of your purchase price goes towards the winnings. So whatever you're gonna win or whatever somebody's gonna win, and a portion goes towards various state programs. And in the 90s, one of those programs became the Heritage Fund, which was to preserve Arizona's heritage. So a certain amount went to state parks and a certain amount went to game and fish that we used a lot of that money for a lot of our endangered species work, a lot of our habitat work, and also for our environmental education or our wildlife education work. So that's where those things come from. I've been in this position for almost 15 years. It'll be 15 years in a couple of weeks. Uh, prior to that, I was a middle school science teacher. So I taught seventh grade science. Um, I also picked up some social studies, some language arts, other types of classes, as, as many of you are probably aware, if you're teaching, you sometimes have to pick up other classes. Um, I did that in both the, the, the Littleton School District over in Avondale and in the Kyrene School District over in Chandler. I've also been involved in uh, non-formal science education for a number of years as well. I've worked at the Phoenix Zoo as an outreach coordinator. I've worked at the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. I have worked with the Challenger Space Center. Um, I've done some curriculum development for organizations like NASA and things like that. So I've been involved in science education in one form or another for well over 20 years. So let's talk about state symbols. And to start with, we're going to talk in very general terms. We're just going to make sure that we're all on the same page. When we're talking about a symbol, we are talking obviously about an object, some kind of object that represents the state. Oftentimes they're used to paint a picture of that state to, to kind of highlight the unique qualities. What makes Arizona special or what makes any particular state special? In the case of Arizona, the first few state symbols were actually chosen by the legislature. The last few have actually been chosen by students and the public to select what animals, plants, or other objects should represent the state of Arizona. And we're going to talk about this history in a little bit more detail, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with what we're talking about here. So we're going to play a little game here. On the next screen, you're going to see pictures of some of the state symbols. What we're going to be focusing on today is what we call the living state symbols. These are the animals and plants because that's of what's most interest to Arizona Game and Fish. Obviously, we deal with wildlife, so that's what our interest is. So we're not going to be talking specifically about the state fossil or the state neckwear or anything like that. We're going to be talking specifically about the living state symbols, the animals and the plants that, re that have been selected to represent the state of Arizona. So on the next slide, you're going to see pictures of all those animals and plants around the border of 
the screen. Okay? And in the middle, there's going to be a clue box. And every few seconds or so, a, a different clue is going to pop up. You're going to get up to three or four clues for each symbol. And your job is to guess which one we're talking about. So as we go through the clues, what you're going to want to do is write down, put your guesses in the chat or the Q&A. Um, there's no prize here, obviously, but we'll see if anybody can, how quickly you can get the clues. Remember, sometimes they are designed to be a little trickier, so they, they're a little bit more vague in the beginning. The first clue is a little bit more vague, and then it goes to much more specific as you get to the third or the fourth clue. Again, we're just having a little fun here to test your understanding of what you already know about the state symbols. I'm going to show you. Here's the screen that you can see. There's the eight state symbols that we're going to be talking about. You'll notice they don't have names for them yet because that's part of this test is to know which do you know what they actually can, can be identified as. So we're going to go ahead and start and you'll see how this works. I'm going to go ahead and show you a clue. As soon as you think you know the answer, feel free to write it into the chat. Here's your first one. I was our first symbol selected in 1901 when Arizona was a territory. Any guesses on what that might be? Let's give you your next one. I'm three inches wide. I can only be seen in May and June. Got a couple guesses. And our final one, I am our state flower. Does anybody know what our state flower is? All right, so pretty much everybody was able to get that we are talking about the saguaro blossom. That is our official state flowers of saguaro blossom. Now, the way that I've done this activity, if you were to do this in the classroom, after each of these, we're going there's, there would be a series of questions that you can ask your students. So not only are you introducing them to the to the symbols, you're also giving the opportunity to teach a little bit about what that about that animal a little bit. What I've done is I've selected one of those questions, and we're just going to briefly talk about it. So you'll see here on the next one. The saguaro blossom is our, is our state flower. Why might this flower be large and grow in great big clusters? Because it's a clustered flower. They grow a bunch of them at one time in the same spot. And they're pretty large flowers for, for what they are. So why do you think the flower has those specific characteristics? Any thoughts? Okay, we've got a lot, of a lot of good guesses coming in. Most people are saying that they bloom at night which will then increase the chances of being pollinated by night pollinators, such as bats. Um, by growing in great big clusters and white, they're going to stand out in the black background of the night and are going to be, well, the thought is they're going to be more easily seen by bats and other night pollinators that might see them a little bit. Because despite what many people think, and this is a, this would be a moment for another another webinar, bats are not actually blind, they can see, especially the ones that are gonna be going to flowers. And so that's largely what we think might be why they grow large, white, and in clusters, okay? So again, as you go through this, there would normally be three or four questions that you can discuss with your classroom. We're only gonna go one for sake of time today. So let's go back to our game board. We've already done the Saguaro Cactus Blossom, so let's see if you can figure out our next one. The legislature chose me in 1931. I'm going to give you a little bit of time between each one, just in case somebody's writing in a response. I eat insects and cactus fruit. We got some answers coming in. They're changing them quickly. I think we have one more here. Oh, I like to sing cha-cha-cha. Now we're getting some answers coming in. And most people have correctly identified the cactus wren as our state bird. Good job. Cactus wren has known that it can survive um, significant amounts of time without drinking water. How do you think it does this? Go ahead and write your responses in the chat or the Q&A. Got some good answers coming in. Most people seem to be saying that it gets water from the food that it eats, moisture from the food, moisture from the cactus. Uh, and for the most part, those are correct. The cactus wren is considered an omnivore, even though it is known to eat the pulp from cactus fruits, it will also eat insects and seeds. Because the nest is partially closed, moisture accumulates in the nest. The high humidity allows the baby birds to survive on the small amount of water they get from the insects that their parents feed them. All right, good job. Let's continue here. And notice it'll get easier as we start eliminating some of these. But they still will remain tricky at times. The legislature chose me in 1954. I am usually green. Got a couple guesses coming in. Some are right, some are wrong. I produce yellow flowers.
I am our state tree. And most of you have figured out now, you've got it there, that we are talking about the Palo Verde. Palo Verde meaning green skin, basically, or green bark. How has the Palo Verde adapted to the lack of water in the desert? So just like our cactus friend has adapted, how has the Palo Verde adapted to a lack of water in the desert? Some people saying tiny leaves, drought deciduous, photosynthesis in the trunk, and even getting into C4 photosynthesis, perhaps. All of these are, are, are true. The green bark does allow a certain amount of photosynthesis. Um, other things that we have, it does not keep its year, leaves year round. They have the small leaves, which allow not as much moisture and not as much water to leave a larger surface area. Um, also, they actually don't keep their leaves year round. We have the drought deciduous. Since photosynthesis, since, sorry, since photosynthesis can occur in the bark of the tree, the plant can drop its leaves during hot months in order to conserve water and still be able to carry out this necessary life function. Also, we didn't get it mentioned. Um, it has some shallow roots, but it also has deep roots as well. Well, um, it can tap into the, the, the groundwater down below as well. Good. All right, gone through a few. Let's try our next one. School children selected me in 1985. I am an excellent climber. A couple guesses coming in. Some right, some wrong. I am usually green. That changed some answers really, really quickly. And I am our state amphibian. Now this one's interesting because I've seen people guess they got they got that it was a frog or a toad of some kind, but the answers of what those are have been quite unique. We've had spadefoot, we've had leopard to leopard frog, we've had tree frog, all different types of ones of people what, what they think is our amphibian. In this case, our state amphibian is called the Arizona tree frog. So let's do a question about that. What adaptations does the tree frog have that help it survive? Any ideas on our tree frog and what helps it survive in Arizona's environment? Not necessarily in the desert, they aren't a desert species. But what helps them survive? We've got some guesses coming in. Some people are saying the skin, that there are some unique adaptations of the skin. Maybe some camouflage that helps it blend in with the, the forest, either the floor or the tree that it may be, might be in. Those are all correct. A couple other ones that they have, it hibernates during the dry seasons. Many of the frogs in Arizona spend much of the year in a dormant phase. The Arizona tree frog is no exception. It is unknown where the frogs spend this time, but they do come out of their inactive state just before the rainy season. It also has special feet to help it climb trees. These frogs have small disc-like pads on the tips of their toes, which give them a better grip on trees and other climbing surfaces. All right, let's continue on our little game here. And we're going pretty quickly through this. If you were teaching this in a class, you might spend more time on each of these specific animals. Here's another one that the school children selected in 1985. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about this 1985 vote, by the way. I am sometimes called a yellow belly. Basically, two potential options for this, and we've seen both those come up. By 1970, I was nearly extinct. And I am our state fish. So, again, we've had a lot of guesses for what the fish could be everything from trout to chub to dace. And this one, in this case, is actually the Apache trout. Apache trout is one of two native trout species in Arizona. So let's do a little question. Why do you think the Apache trout nearly became extinct by 1970? What was happening that might have caused the Apache trout to go extinct? We have a couple guesses of habitat loss, introduced species, rivers drying up, being out competed by other fish, disease, all very, very good answers. Um, overfishing is often a cause that we see with fish. Although this is often a cause of endangerment and extinction for marine animals, this is not the primary cause for the Apache trout's decline. However, for a while, streams with Apache trout were closed to fishing to ensure no further reduction of the species. So we don't really credit 
overfishing as being a major issue. Doesn't say that it wasn't an issue, just that it wasn't the major issue causing its decline. But habitat loss, um, Apache trout has certainly seen a significant decline in its available habitat. Some estimates claim the fish may have lost up to 95% of its original habitat. This loss is due to a number of factors, including habitat degradation from cattle grazing, logging, damming, and irrigation as well as takeovers by competing species of fish that have been introduced. And that leads us to our number one cause, which is the introduction of non-native species of fish, particularly the brown and the brook trout, which, which was mentioned specifically by Franklin. Not only do these other fish compete for the limited space and food resources, but they also they hybridize with the Apache trout, which lowers the amount of pure Apache trout DNA. In addition, since these non-native species of trout spawn early in the year, they actually eat the eggs and the young of Apache trout. So that has been a significant issue, one that we are working on, and we are we have had a, a good amount of success with the Apache trout in Arizona. All right, we've only got a couple more, so this should be getting much, much easier now. Here's another one that the school children selected in 1985. I prefer to live in rock crevices. Still two potential options for this one, probably. I have an upturned nose. And I am our state reptile. And somebody actually nailed, Kathy actually got the, the exact name of our state reptile, which is the Arizona ridge nose rattlesnake. All right, so why do rattlesnakes have a rattle? What do they use the rattle for? Most people are saying a warning, protection. Good. The sound of the rattle is intended to be a message that the snake sends to potential predators or even large animals like humans that otherwise might not see it and could ultimately step on it. What you'll notice is so on, on all of these questions that you can ask the students, we do provide you with potential responses that the students might have. We not only do we include the correct answers or what we think are the correct answers, but we also do some include ones that we think your students might say. But, but how, and then how you can correct them because they might not be correct. And one of them is um, there is an idea out there in some cases that, that animals actually, some, some students actually believe that they use the rattle to actually help capture their prey. And so we actually have a way that, that you can address that and that how it's not used as, as a form of capture. It's actually used, um, they don't use the rattle to hunt. They use it um, in protection as well. So when you, when you download your own res the resources related to this, you'll be able to get all of these questions and answers right in your hand. I think we've got two more. It's getting easier. And these ones are pretty different from each other. So again, school children selected me in 1985. Those kids were busy in 1985 sometimes called a miner's cat, but I'm not really a cat. I am our state mammal, and most of you have gotten that we're talking about the ringtail. Sometimes it's called a miner's cat, sometimes it's actually called a ringtail cat, but its official name is just ringtail because it's not a cat species. It's actually more closely related to raccoons and coatis. It's in the same family. So, why do you think people call it a ringtail cat or even a miner's cat? Any ideas why how it picked up that name? It got the ringtail definitely because it had the the rings along its thing, but why would people associate it with a cat or being a miner? It looked like a helmet. Okay. Good. There's actually a really interesting story to some of this. Although they are timid at first, ringtails quickly lose their fear of humans. The creatures like to explore dark caves created by miners. People used to domesticate the ringtail by providing food and shelter. In exchange, the ringtail would rid the miners' cabins of mice and other rodents. So the miners would actually use the ringtails to take care of the pests around the miners' camp. And so that's where they got the name Miner's Cat or even the ringtail cat, because they have a cat-like appearance and they were easily domesticated. All right, one more. Let's get our story here. Arizona residents and the state legislature chose me in 2001. I am bright yellow and have two tails. Most people are figuring out that our state butterfly is what we call the two-tailed swallowtail. And what I'm going to ask here then is, does the butterfly really have two tails? 
The answer's coming in. Most people are saying no. In reality, the tails are actually extensions of the hind wings. This butterfly derives its name because each hind wing has two tails, in quotes. Tail-like extensions are common in many species of butterflies and may be used to trick predators into thinking that they are antennas. When it comes down to bite the head, the butterfly can then fly off in the opposite direction. Good job. All right, so we've done our little bit of an introduction there. So really quickly, I wanted to go through a timeline. Um, I know there's a lot on this slide. You don't need to memorize all this stuff. You'll have access to all of this information. But I wanted to give you a timeline of what we're what we were talking about with some of our state symbols. And I'm including more than just the living state symbols in this one. You can see that in 1911, we actually created our state seal with the motto Ditat Deus. Um, that was actually before, just before we became a state, right, as we were becoming a state. 1915, we got our official colors, which was blue and old gold. 1917 was our flag. We had a march song come a little bit later. The bird and the flower both came around the same time. The tree. Then we developed the neckwear. We actually have an official neckwear. It's the bolo tie. We have a gemstone. And then, as I mentioned, in 1985, they became official. They were voted on in 1985 by students. And then in 1986, they became official state representatives, which was our amphibian fish, mammal, and reptile. We got a fossil, which was petrified wood. Butterfly came in 2003 when it became official. And then in 2011, we made the official state gun of Arizona, which was the Colt single action revolver. So there's a rough timeline where you can see what we're talking about. We're going to spend a little bit of time now looking at that what was going on in 1985 and the amphibian fish mammal and reptile were selected because there was something special going on there we're calling this the 1985 election this was basically a publicity stunt that the arizona game and fish commission put together as part of um, wildlife awareness week and the goal was that we were going to we ran this as a campaign where the students were going to select these the, the next state animal representatives and so their job was to research 800 animals found in Arizona, and then in those four categories, amphibian, reptile, fish, and mammal, four were going to be selected. So the kids got to research different animals, and then in the end, four were selected. And then informational flyers about those four animals in each of those categories, so a total of 16 animals, there were informational flyers that were created, essentially like a ballot or campaign material. This is an example of two of them. These are the actual documents. They're actually about 11 by 17. You're going to have access to all four of them. You'll actually see them on the on the the information that I provide to you. So if you if you're interested in that piece of history, this is what they look like. And you can see on the left, you can see the mammal one, and on the right, you can see the reptile one. So these are the animals that they got to choose from. On the mammal side, we were talking about the coos white-tailed deer, the desert bighorn sheep, the javelina, and the ringtail. And as you already know, the ringtail is the one that actually won. You can see they include some information about the about each of the animals, so the students could make an informed decision about the animal. And then on the the reptile side, they had the choice of the Gila monster, the desert tortoise, the Arizona Originals rattlesnake, and the regal horned lizard. Those were the four choices that they had. And as we have already explained, the Arizona Originals rattlesnake was the one that won. Here's the results. You can see some were close. The mammal and the reptile were a little bit closer. The fish and the amphibian weren't all that close. Again, you're going to have time to look at all of these. In fact, I'm going to come back to this slide in just a minute. But I just wanted to show you this is what they were voting on in 1985, and those were the results. Then it became official. Representative Larry Hawk was the one who introduced the bill. Once the kids voted, we presented it as a bill. Larry Hawk introduced it to the legislature, and you can see there's the actual text in our statutes that shows what the state animals would be, the ringtail, the Arizona Originals rattlesnake, the Arizona trout, and the Arizona tree frog shall be known respectively as a state mammal, reptile, fish, and amphibian. And they became official on August 13th of 1986. I want to go back for a minute here, though, and look at this data again. As you look at this data, do you notice anything? Is there any pattern that sticks out to you? Anything unusual or something that looks and says, hmm, I wonder if that made a difference. Go ahead and write your thoughts if you notice anything about these results. Looks like some people are starting to figure it out. If not, let's give you a little bit of a hint here. What do you notice now? 
should see now that in three of the four cases of when the students were voting, Arizona was in the name. So there's been some thought here that maybe, just maybe, there was a little bit of election bias here, that you, we were asking the students to vote for an Arizona representative, and so they selected the one that had Arizona in its name. The only time that that didn't happen was in the mammals where there wasn't a choice to have Arizona in the name. So this has widely been speculated for a number of years. So we wanted to take a look at it a little bit. How can you determine if there was actually bias? It's nice to say, yes, the one with Arizona won. And in some cases, they won by quite a bit. But was it truly election bias or did it just happen that way? Okay. The challenge is this took place more than 30 years ago. And we really don't have the data that we need to determine why the students were voting. We didn't ask them, why did you select that animal? So without that information, we don't know what their reasoning was. But we got a little bit of a clue shortly after the election. As some of you might have figured out if you were paying close attention to the legislative, the statute that appeared, there was a name change that occurred. Back in the 80s, shortly after this election, we had a fish. It used to be called the Arizona trout, and it eventually got its name changed to the Apache trout. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but it gave me a little bit of an idea. So a number of years ago, I used to run an article, an educational article in the magazine that Game and Fish produces. If you're not familiar, we produce a magazine called the Arizona Wildlife Views. And for a number of years, they had, they let me do like a two-page educational article in there. Had some activities, some reading stuff for kids to do. But what I decided to do was run a mock election because I was curious if... We were to host the election this year with it being Apache trout instead of Arizona trout. Would that change the results? Would we see a different winner? So rather than voting on all four of them, I took the name change of the trout. And so I had the magazine readers had the opportunity to select between the same four animals that they had for the fish, except this time it was called the Apache trout instead of the Arizona trout. And then sort of as a control, I also had them re-vote on the mammal. So I basically just put it out to the readers and I said, hey, if we were going to select a new representative today, which one do you think would best represent Arizona? And they got to select. So we did that. They submitted the results. And this is what we found. So on the top, you see the 1985 results and the percentages. And then when I did this election, it was in 2012. What do you notice about differences, if any, of the elections that we hosted? While you're writing, you should also notice that the Apache trout was not the only one that changed its name. We actually changed the name of the Colorado River squawfish, became the Colorado pike minnow. So we did have two fish that changed names. So you'll notice in here that the fish one didn't change all that much. Apache trout still got the majority of the vote. So having Arizona's name didn't change it. People were people still voted for Apache trout. The only change was that the desert pupfish actually raised a little bit while the Colorado pike minnow went down. What was interesting, though, is on the other side of that, the ringtail would no longer be our representative. It would be the javelina, followed closely by the desert bighorn sheep and the white-tailed deer. Okay. Now, we're getting all kinds of questions that are coming in here because people are starting to analyze a little bit. Since we're talking about election bias, let's be perfectly clear up here that my election was by no means scientific and was not necessarily intended to be biased as well right? There were pictures that were included. Somebody asked, did you include pictures? There were pictures. I don't believe I included a full description quite like they had before. I might have included a little bit of a description, but not a full description. So that they had a little bit less information. It was a different read. It was a different audience. If remember, it was kids that were selecting before. In this one, it was readers of our magazine. Now, our magazine is a very general interest magazine. So not only are there people that are just interested in wildlife in general, there are also hunters that read that magazine. There are fishermen that read that magazine. There are people that go bird watching that read that magazine magazine, I can suspect that maybe the shift happened because a, a large percentage of our readership is going to be hunters. And perhaps if you see the ones that beat out the ringtail, the, the three above them are also legally hunted big game species. So maybe that shifts a little bit. On the other side, when we look at the Apache trout and the desert pupfish, those are the ones that change the most and increase their percentage the most. Um, I can guess that maybe that that's what had been in the news a lot. There's been a lot of talk. Those are both some in, um, endangered and, and threatened species that, that have been out there a lot. There's been a lot of information about that. So that might have, that, that could account for the change a little bit. Don't know for certain. 
Okay. But what I like about this activity and certainly something you could do with your own students, you could replicate this. You could have the students do it. You could run a school-wide election it's doing a similar process. It just gets some thinking about elections in general and how difficult it can be to make a fair election, but how important it can be because you don't know what the thing is that's going to shift something. And you want to make sure that as you're planning an election, you're not triggering people to vote for something based off of the way it's placed on the ballot or how it how it's worded or any number of things like that. And so these are all the, the factors that go in to selecting you know how how a ballot's going to be set up and how an election is going to take place. So there's some really cool learning opportunities in here. I don't claim to learn anything from this particular thing. I, I don't I still can't answer 100 percent whether or not there was election by it. I suspect that in 1985, the kids were probably still voting for the animal because it had the Arizona trout in its name or the Arizona name. Um, but I can't prove that conclusively. All I can do is speculate on that. These results didn't um, show that. They also didn't show that it wasn't happening. If you're talking about surveys in your science class, how you have to look at the data from a survey is how was the data collected? What was the audience of the of the survey? What were the people that were you know collecting it? Who was collecting it? All those different types of things matter. So it's a good illustration of that type of thing. So with that, this is where I'm going to talk briefly about some activities. So we have an activity that we call selecting a class symbol, which follows the same lines of this. So you've taught the state symbols, and now you want to teach the election process and the campaign process. So this works really well on, a, on an election year, like the one we're facing right now. If you want to replicate, since the kids themselves, most of them can't vote unless they're in high school and they're 18, they can't vote. But if you want to replicate what voting is like, you can do an activity like this. So in this case, what you're going to have is students are going to vote on an animal or animals to represent the class. Much like we created um, state symbols, you're going to create class symbols. And so the way this works is that you break the class into groups. And so you have groups that are going to look at the mammals, groups that are going to look at the fish, birds, reptiles, amphibians, whichever ones you want to look at. Obviously, our push is going to be towards the wildlife, but you can choose whatever you want. And so there's going to be a group of your students that are going to be just looking at just mammals. And their job is to ultimately narrow down all the mammals in Arizona to two mammals, what they think are the two best mammals to represent the state. And then another group is going to narrow all the birds down to two birds that they think would be the best birds to represent the state, and so on through all the different animals. And then what you do is within those groups now, you split them up again. And half of the mammal group, so let's say you have four kids that were in your mammal group. Now you say two of them are going to take one of the mammals you selected, and two of them are going to take the other mammal you selected. And their job now is to campaign for that animal. They need to convince the rest of the class why that animal should be the one that represents the class. So maybe your, your class decides that they want the black bear and the beaver to represent the state. And so a, a small amount of your kids are going to be researching the black bear. Maybe they create a poster. Maybe they create a slogan. Maybe you have them create a speech that they have to give in front of the class on why the black bear should be what we select. And then you're going to have another group of kids that's going to do the same thing for the beaver. And they're going to create a little fun poster and a slogan, and they're going to pitch it to the class in front of you. Know, so they're going to create a campaign. Right? And then at the end, once everybody's presented their campaigns and their speeches and, and all that stuff, you, you show a ballot. You can see I have a rough idea of a ballot over there on the right. You would, you would write in the different animals, and then each kid would vote. And in the end, you tally them, and that's how you now represent, oh, look, the black bear was the one that won, and the elegant trogan for the bird was the one that won. And so on. Once you've done that, if you chose to, you can move it to the next level, which is following in the footsteps of the state. Once the kids voted on the on the state symbols, we went to the legislature and it was now a, it had to be a bill that was introduced to the legislature that ultimately got voted on and became a, a law once it was signed by the governor. You could do something similar if you're in your social studies class and you're teaching how to be, how a bill becomes a law. Why not use it on this election that your kids have already done? So now you, you mimic what happened in 1985 and 1986 by saying, okay, we've selected the black bear as our mammal. Now we have to make it a law. And they can follow that. They can write the bill. They can follow in their class how that might become a law. So they're going to mimic and model 
that process in their classroom. Now you've taught them elections. You focus on the election season and campaigns and what that go, what what goes into that. You can talk about bias elections, bias surveys, all those types of things, and then you can follow that up with how a bill becomes a law. So kind of cool how you can integrate all this wildlife into these types of social studies concepts. And you're going to see that in a lot of game and fish activities that we create. We believe that wildlife is a hook. There's not many kids out there that don't like animals. And so why not use that interest that they already come to your classroom with to teach the subjects that you need to teach, right? You can teach how a bill becomes a law in any way. But if your kids are already interested in wildlife, why don't you use that to teach them the same concept? So that's one activity to expand on what you're doing. Now, let's say you're doing that in social studies, but you don't want science to be left behind. So we have an activity called Wildlife Detective. It's, it's nothing fancy, but it basically focuses on birds, specifically the cactus wren. The idea being that of all the wildlife that's out there, birds can be found just about anywhere. Every school ground has birds. If you're in a desert environment, you may actually have some cactus wrens. So we center around the cactus wrens because that's the state symbol of, of that we're concerned about. But we're going to expand beyond cactus wrens in case your school doesn't have any cactus wrens. But they're probably going to have grackles and pigeons and quail and dove and, and all those different types of stuff. Um, and so this is now your, your science teacher or you as a science teacher um, once you finish your social studies, can now bring in this interest that you've been doing in social studies with the state symbols to now have the kids go out on the school grounds and start observing birds. Hopefully they get to observe the cactus wren. But now they can collect data. So they go out there and they walk around the school grounds. They determine they can measure temperature, cloud cover, the species that they observe, the numbers of species, the number of birds that they saw. Um, and then that, that allows them to collect. They can start analyzing the data. And then from there, they can generate research questions, hypotheses, predictions. You could ultimately maybe turn it into an experiment if you wanted the kids to do a comparative experiment, for example. Or if the kids wanted to do that, you don't have to show them. They can do it where maybe they want to compare the birds that they see in the fall versus the birds that they see in the spring. And so you have them go out multiple times throughout the school year to see if that changes. So you're adding a science component that's loosely based off of what they're learning in social studies by tying it in with the state symbols. So those are some activities. Let's talk about the state seal. As I mentioned earlier, the state seal was actually adopted in 1911. It is actually part of the Arizona Constitution. So the state seal is actually in the Constitution. As we mentioned, the state motto is Daitat Deus, which means God and riches. And there's a picture of the state seal. It is believed by many that the state seal includes what we call the five C's of Arizona. So for those social studies people here, if you remember your social studies civics, can anybody tell me what the five C's are? These are five C words that are thought to represent Arizona. So what is it about Arizona that starts with a C? For those of you that can remember, we've got a couple that have popped up here. Cotton, copper, climate, cattle. And there's one more. Somebody said cactus. You would think cactus, but that actually was not considered one of the five Cs. We got the last one was citrus. So copper, cotton, cattle, citrus, and climate were considered the five C's. So just like we had state symbols that sort of painted a unique picture of Arizona, we have the sort of slogan of the five C's, which, rep which, which is thought to represent Arizona, at least Arizona of the past. So people look at the state seal and they think that these five C's are represented in there. So we did a little bit of analysis. I looked at some history. I saw what some historians were writing and let's analyze it a little bit. This is the actual wording in the Constitution. Again, I apologize. You don't necessarily have to read all of this, but this is as it appears in the Constitution. The seal of the state shall be the following design, and then it goes through there. So the question is, if the five C's were purposely put into the state seal, we should see evidence of them appearing in the language of the description of it. So what do we notice? Well, we do notice that there's a, there is a reference to climate. It's not direct, but it talks about with the sun rising behind the peaks. So that's probably a reference to climate, probably a pretty safe guess. We also notice that there is a specific reference to cattle, right, at the right of which are cattle grazing, so there's cattle in the state seal. So those are the easy ones. Now it gets a little bit trickier. We have to think beyond what's in the text a little bit. So we have this reference to irrigated fields. It doesn't say cotton specifically, so we have to think, were they referencing cotton? If they wanted cotton, wouldn't they have drawn a cotton plant, for example? So it's questionable about whether irrigated fields actually stood for cotton. 
Another one that is, is up in the air is this idea of orchards. It says orchards, doesn't say what specifically. Could that be citrus? Perhaps, we don't know. And the other one that I think is up in the air a little bit is copper. It does reference minor, and there's a minor in the seal, but it's actually talking about quartz. Okay, so whether or not it represented copper, we don't know. So could you look at the state seal and think that, yes, the five C's might be in there? You could. Here's what I will tell you. The state seal was created in 1911. It was put into our constitution in, in 1911, 1912. We don't know where the five C's originated. We don't really have a background of where who created it first or when it was created, but it's pretty widely thought that the five C's concept didn't come around until the 1950s. So if the five C's didn't appear until the 1950s, it's hard to imagine that they were explicitly put into the state seal. Okay. So just some interesting little tidbits there on the state seal. The reason I mention this though, is there, there has an opportunity here for you to bring this back to your classroom and our state symbols. You could have the students design a new state seal. So the argument would be, does the current state seal represent the Arizona of today? Are the things that we see on that image of the state seal still representative of Arizona today? If it is, that's great. If not, then what would it look like? What characteristics would you include on a new state seal? So in this case, this is the things that I would actually ask the students is, what do you think we should include? In fact, I'll put that out to you guys. If you could redesign the state seal today, what's one thing from Arizona that you would like to see appear on the state seal. If you if we could redo it today. Ooh, there's some good ones coming through. Now, what I will say is when I first created this activity, this was also occurring at the same time when the, the US Mint was creating the state quarters. And so this fit in really nicely with that. So rather than creating a state seal, you had the opportunity to create the backside of a, of a quarter representing Arizona. What would you do? So it had the similar concept to it. Some interesting things coming in here. Some people have said the saguaro or some kind of cactus. Um, indigenous people got represented a couple different ways or indigenous farming methods. These are all some great answers. Turquoise, maybe the Palo Verde. Since somebody brought up the Palo Verde, that would be my next question. You could extend this one more step with your students and say, if one of our state symbols had to be represented on the state seal, which one would you choose and why? Again, having the students explain, maybe they really think the ringtail should be up, up there. Many of you, it seems from your own answers, would say the saguaro. Um, others might believe that it should be the rattlesnake because being largely a, a desert, you know, half the state being desert, then the, we should have a rattlesnake or something like that. Somebody said the bolo tie, for sure. <laughs> Putting that onto the state seal would be interesting. So again, just another activity where you can tie this in. You can allow your students to get creative, but also still engage them in some learning and some explanation on what, what, what they're doing here. All right, so that's a quick end to what we we're talking about. Now, as far as the resources go, if you visit our website, azgfd.gov slash focus wild, if you click on the themes tab and then you find Arizona state symbols, and I'll show you this in just a minute here, then you'll see all of the information that we downloaded. In fact, I'm going to go to that right now. Let me bring up the website if I can see here. So if you go to the Game of Fish website and if you were to scroll all the way down to the bottom down here, there's a section under education that says teachers. So you click on teachers and bring you to our Focus Wild website. You can also go to the link that was on that PowerPoint that you saw before. Now over here on the left-hand side, it says themes. You click on themes. Now these are themed resources. So we've put resources that, that all relate to different themes. And you can see some different ones that we have in here. There's one on specific species, but all the way down here at the bottom under miscellaneous themes, it says Arizona state symbols. When you click on that, it's going to bring up another website. These are all the different things that we talked about. So here's all the information about adoption information. So the background history that I was sharing with you in that quiz that we took at the beginning. Um, here are the four links for those, those information sheets, the ones that have the descriptions of the four different animals that they got to vote on. Here's the interactive quiz as a PowerPoint, as a YouTube video, and then there's some background information. There's some additional worksheets. And then here's some other activities that relate to state symbols. So all kinds of information freely available to you. You can see that I did not have to log in to, to get there. All right. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and bring this back here. If you need to get in touch with me, there's my information. Email is the best way to get in touch with me. But let's go here and see if there's any questions. 
Calla Verde is a state tree. Which variety are all of them? The foothill or the blue was asked by Steve. That's a really good, um, really good question. And I'm going to tell you that I don't know 100%. I'm going to guess that it was just keeping it very generic. However, we could probably go into statute. I thought I was going to go back into the statute that I showed here earlier, but that only showed the ones from 1985. We would have to go into the statute because I think the statute does indicate the specific species. And so we would have to go in there probably and, and identify. But that's a very, very good question is whether it's it's a specific type of Palo Verde or general. I'm going to say it's it's trying to keep it more general. All right. So thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for taking a, a little bit of your time. I know you have a busy time and your time is valuable. And, I, and I'm humbled by the fact that you would choose to spend an hour with me. Thanks a lot. I will hopefully see you guys in a future workshop. Thanks.